everyone, and welcome to Plugin and Set Sales, our webinar today on the electrified waterway. My name is Symbiat Youssef, Member Relations Manager at Fourth, and I will be making some announcements um, from the Fourth team before I pass it along to our moderator today. Our moderator today is Kelly Stevens. She is the Senior Manager of Strategic Communication and Partnerships at Fourth. And attendees, we ask that you please be sure to submit your questions through the attendee chat during the webinar today. We will get through as many of the questions as we can during our Q&A portion of the webinar. So please get this coming during the webinar and we will get through them. Uh, we will also be sharing the webinar recording and slides as well as additional resources with you all at the at, shortly at the end of the webinar, and we'll make sure to include um, some additional resources that will help further the discussions and the conversation around electrified waterways. And as we always do, we do our introduction to Fourth, who we are, and what we do. Fourth is a nonprofit trade association advocating for smart transportation. We work in four main focus areas, which are um, industry developments demonstration project, policy advocacy, and consumer engagement. And through all of these efforts, we aim to advance smart, clean transportation in an equitable manner for all. And our work would not be possible without the support of our members. Um, we wanna say thank you to our members and sponsors for making these webinars and the fourth work possible. Um, if your organization is interested in visibility on the webinars or um, supporting the fourth mission by joining as a member, please feel free to reach out to myself, Symbiat Youssef. My email is on the slide. Um, I will also be the person sending all of you all the webinar recaps so you can contact me that way as well and we would love to get the conversation started on membership and support and as you know, Roadmap is coming to you all June 14th through the 16th, but we want you all to save on registration. Early adopter registration rates um, will end and um, the prices will go up on April 1st. It's not an April Fool's joke. Uh, the prices will be going up on April 1st, 2021. Um, please register and save now. If you have any information or if you need any information, um, want to learn more about what's to come uh, for Roadmap 2021, please feel free to go to our website, roadmapfort.org. If you are interested, if your organization is interested or your company is interested in sponsoring the conference as well, please reach out to Ashley Duplanty, Ford's International Marketing Manager. And um, we will also be announcing the um, roadmap program shortly as well. So many more information to come from that. And with that, I will pass it along to our moderator today, Kelly Stevens. Kelly? Hello everyone, I'm Kelly, and as a boater and water lover myself, I'm thrilled to be here with all of you and our two great panelists to talk about electrified waterways. And as Cindy mentioned, I'm the Senior Manager of Strategic Partnerships and Communications at Forth, and I manage the team that supports and convenes our large and diverse ecosystem of stakeholders in the smart transportation sector, from utilities to businesses, policymakers, uh, community benefit organizations. We really uh, work to bring these groups together and advance solutions. So I'm again, I'm thrilled to be here with you all and I'd like to introduce our speakers today and then we'll do a brief poll. Alexander Oki is head of finance and business development at Pure Watercraft, a Seattle-based leader in electric outboard propulsion tech. And also joining us is Kevin Bartoy, environmental stewardship and Sustainability Program Manager with Washington State Ferries. And I have a warm-up question for Alexander and Kevin, and I invite everyone here to share your answers in the chat as well. So believe it or not, summer is right around the corner. If you could spend a day on an electrified boat, how would you spend the day, and what electric water vessel would you use? And let's start with Alexander. Sure. Uh, I'd probably opt for a 
we we have a a, a boat club that we we've been operating just as 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 a pilot program. It's called Pure Watercraft Club, and it, it basically you just use a like a mobile app and you pay for a, a small recurring membership fee. And you can go out on on a uh, our fleet of uh, electric pontoon boats on Lake Union in, in Seattle or Lake Washington if you want. I think that's uh, that's probably how I would choose to uh, to recreate. You know, get some of that you know clean quiet, high performance uh, <laughs> recreational boating in. That sounds wonderful. And Kevin? Well, I'd have to think into the future a little bit to our uh, electric fleet. Our, our governor, Governor Jay Inslee, my big boss, always likes to say every Washingtonian owns a boat. So I would love to be plying uh, the waters perhaps up in the San Juans or on our Bremerton to Seattle route with wonderful views of Mount Rainier there on a electric uh, ferry, but hearing Alexander's uh, uh, vessels and, and their project there, I might also want to jump on there and do some crabbing on an electric boat. That sounds great. Well, when it's safe to do so, I may have to be a stowaway with you both. That sounds like an amazing way to spend a day. And we're going to have a brief poll now for everyone before we get fully underway. And the question for everyone is what industry sector do you represent? So please go ahead and respond to that so we can read the room and see who's here. And as I mentioned, we have this broad and diverse range of stakeholders who are always part of these conversations. So this is great to see. All right. So let's go ahead and close the poll. And unfortunately, I can't actually see the results uh, on my end of it. So Cindy, do you mind jumping in and telling us what you're seeing? Yes, it looks like we have a lot of utility representation and non-government um, government representation, as well as some others. And I see the chat, um, we have some chats um, coming in, electric utility, battery, providential government uh, coming in as well. That's great. And it's really interesting because Alexander and Kevin both represent different areas and industries of the electric water, uh, electric water, sorry, electrified waterways. Goodness. Um, so it's great to see that we have so many different perspectives in the room, and I'm sure we'll all learn something interesting today. So now I'd like to officially begin our panelist presentations, followed by the Q&A session. So please remember to add your questions in the chat for our Q&A later. And I'm now going to turn it over to Alexander Oki for his presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, so I guess I can do oh, there. There are my slides. Well, uh, hello everyone, and, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you so much. It's uh, it's really wonderful to be with you. And and uh, um, once again, my name is Alexander Oki. I'm with Pure Watercraft, and uh, we build uh, electric outboard motors for boats. Uh, so, to a uh, high-level view, what is it that Pure Watercraft is doing? We we build a a powertrain platform uh, right now that uh, is is capable of replacing up to 50 horsepower gas outboards, um, which we hope will will be um, category-defining technology that allow us to uh, lead to a brand new era of boating uh, that will that will transition the 50 billion dollar global boating industry. Uh, to uh, a better, uh, more enjoyable, more convenient, zero uh future. Uh, and you'll note that we have, as, as part of our company, sort of a, a, a big focus on efficiency. Uh, it's what, it's what can, uh, confers such uh, high performance uh, to our, our end users and great value uh, at the end of the day. Um, but that also uh, uh, you know, stems to our, our the channel and, and the way that we actually will uh, will deliver and serve uh, our customers. Um, so so uh, we're moving to uh, to production for our first product, which is again replaces up to 50 horse gas outboards in, in the summer of 2021, uh, based out of our facility, our headquarters in Seattle. Uh, and we're going to be delivering these systems through uh, a, a direct to consumer sales channel. Take a step back and. and Maybe it's worth understanding a little bit about 
why why we do what we do and what's what's really motivated this team. So Pure uh, Watercraft was was founded um, really uh, by a group of folks that that took a lot of inspiration by some of the technological advances we were seeing uh, back in the the um, you know in 20, uh, uh, 2008 with the when Tesla came out with the Roadster and took a lot of inspiration from the fact that these electric vehicles were able to go you know 120 miles an hour on a freeway and we thought well why can't uh, why can't we be doing that with with boating and recreational boats specifically and of course realized that no one was actually doing it so that that was sort of the genesis of pure watercraft we decided to take a clean sheet approach to to build uh, the best uh, way to power a vessel and it turns out that uh, that that best way is to use electric uh, propulsion technology and so our mission at pure watercraft is to um, build uh, the, the technologies uh, that enable a, a revolutionary era of boating uh, that's more enjoyable, accessible, and environmentally friendly for everyone. When we initially started, uh, Pure Watercraft was founded in 2011. Our first product was actually to electrify a stern drive, uh, so a 21-foot cobalt runabout, which many of you may be familiar with the cobalt brand. So. We thought at the time, you know, looking around at the, the waterways in the Pacific Northwest, everyone's got a cobalt runabout. You know, it, that's that's the only type of boat there is, is, is one of these kind of stern drive, open bow uh, boats, 21 foot or so. And um, it turns out, if you look at this chart, we were, we were pretty wrong. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's about uh, 5% of boats that are sold in the United States in a given year in that stern drive category. Um, and so while we were successful at, at electrifying a cobalt, uh, we got to, uh, to the point where it could go uh, 48 miles per hour, fully battery electric. It could pull water skiers, uh, and was a was a technological achievement. But we realized that it wasn't really a, a, a product uh, that that could sell uh, in any in any meaningful volume, where we could build a business that could actually help us accomplish our long term mission uh, of making boating much much better. In order to do that, we believe you have to go to where the volume is. And so in 2013, we decided to pivot to focus on outboard. Uh, uh, powertrain technologies. Uh, you can see uh, 80, 84% of, uh, of boats that are sold in the U.S. in 2019, at least, uh, were uh, powered by outboard motors. You know, to drill down a little bit, and um, you know, this is obviously uh, a global a global Sorry. opportunity. Oh, Sorry, Siri, my Siri is going off. Um, uh, so uh, the uh, our first powertrain, which you know again replaces up to a 50 horse gas outboard, uh, really targets the center of, of global boating's power distribution curve. In this case, we, while we thought that initially the, the fortune in boating would be at the top of the pyramid, those those kind of luxury runabout boats uh, made by folks like Cobalt, really the fortune's actually at the bottom. It's 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 in a, that first power class that we pivoted to this uh, 25 to 50 horsepower range, which as you can see from this chart. Uh, is is far and away uh, where the volume is uh, in, in in terms of global units. The United States is is the world's largest boating market with 15.7 million boats today. Um, but that that's only uh, about a fifth of the the total boats out there in the world. It uh, might be worth touching on some of our our own biases uh, around boating and, and recreational boating in particular. These statistics statistics may surprise you. I'm guessing from the the audience uh, on the call, you know, most of us uh, probably the odds are, uh, are are likely that you were able to go boating in the past year, especially because COVID. Um, you know, one of the one of the safest ways to recreate with friends and family was actually to go out on a boat. Um, and these these statistics are from pre or pre pandemic statistics. Um, some of the things that are interesting. I mean, one, you know, boating is is a big opportunity, particularly in in the United States. Um, so there's one one boat per every ten households uh, across the states. But look at how much the the distribution varies uh, geographically. Um, so much much greater penetration rates in the upper Midwest and Midwest and Florida than on the coasts. Um, and you know some of the pieces that really really uh, kind of inspire us to do what we do are are these opportunities for improvement. Um, so one of the the statistics that you know I, I hope does surprise many of you is the, the statistic we have under under our gas under our gas line item. Uh, so uh, you know 95% of boaters fill up at car gas stations. So you can't have a thesis where you you believe that uh, all of all of automotive is is eventually going to be powered by electric vehicles. 
an electric, you know, electric propulsion technology uh, and not believe voting won't follow suit. Um, moreover, the pollution line item is something that really motivates us personally. So and I think it may surprise some of you that outboard motors are, are some of the worst and most notorious uh, sources of uh, non-CO2 emissions. So it's those carcinogenic um, uh, smog uh, inducing, smog creating um, uh, carbon monoxides, oxides of nitrogen and hydrocarbon emissions, the ones that are that are really, really bad for you. And by, by shifting from a gas outboard to a pure outboard, uh, it has the same effect as removing 125 cars from our roadways because outboard motors, gas outboards, do not have catalytic converters. And so uh, there was about uh, just about 8 million tons of CO2 emissions um, from the carbon dioxide emissions side, 8 million tons generated from recreational boats in, in 2017 alone, which is the same amount of, of CO2 emissions uh, that came from all of the buses in the United States of America. Uh, so we've got, a, we've got a real opportunity that 40 million plus uh, ton uh, uh, number there is, uh, is a global uh, number. And so what do we do? We, here's here's our, our solution. We build this uh, outboard propulsion, propulsion system, which you see on the right there, uh, which can be sold either as a repower uh, or as part of a complete boat package. And we build a number of different components. So there's our outboard motor, which is 105 pounds, our battery pack, which is 118 pounds, the charger, a speed controller, a throttle, and our mobile uh, application. And uh, we've, we've developed virtually all the key components in this technology with uh, an emphasis on efficiency. So again, uh, by, by doing things like designing our own propeller in-house, our, uh, our own electric motor, um, our own motor controller, our own battery pack architecture and thermal management systems, we can confer the most power per pound uh, and, and the best uh, overall cost to our, uh, to our end user uh, that's out there today for electric propulsion. I'll, I will talk briefly about the, uh, the battery pack technology. Um, so our, uh, the battery pack in, in electric vehicles, this is where uh, half of the, the costs and complexity are in any uh, vehicle or vessel that you might see. Uh, and our, our battery pack technology, uh, we think can hold its own against some of the, the, the best and brightest in, in EVs. We've got energy density in line with that of the Tesla Model 3 pack, despite being one ninth the size. Uh, and our active thermal management in our battery pack can, can uh, provide um, actually better cooling than, than that of the Model 3 battery pack because uh, the, uh, the uh, pack, um, uh, sorry, the, uh, the cooling needs uh, in boating are much greater uh, than those of a car uh, because when uh, the, the power that a boat requires to go at top speed when it's fighting the, the wetted surface area uh, are much greater than, uh, than the, the energy that a car requires to go at, feel at uh, uh, freeway speeds when they're just trying to overcome uh, air resistance. A brief uh, slide on range. One of the nice things about our battery pack is it's modular. So uh, it's, it's very simple to just add a second battery pack and you just use one cable to sort of daisy chain up to 10 minutes together. Um, you can see a, a few different common applications here, but basically most of our, our customers are, are, are great with just two battery packs and charging is very simple. Um, so the nice thing is we don't have to spend a lot of money on these big uh, charging networks like you might see in over the road uh, because most cars typically go from point A to point B, but most boats just go from point A and then they return back to the place from, from where they were launching. When you get home, you know, again, most boats are refueled at automotive gas stations. So uh, when, you, when you get home to your garage and you've trailered your boat, uh, you're, you're able to recharge from half to full in as little as 90 minutes if you're using 220 volt or overnight if you're using a stand, standard household outlet. I'll skip through the, the competitive advantages and, and just kind of leave you with the thought on our direct to consumer sales model. So we, we really uh, have to feel like we have to take the time with a novel product like ours to really do a lot of customer education. And we want to make sure that our customers know that um, when, when they decide to, to purchase a pure outboard, this is really just the beginning of a relationship. We want them to know that we've got their back and that uh, they're not going to seem foolish for trying a new technology, even though we believe that the benefits are, are, are really clear. Um, and so here's how we, we go on our, our, our direct-to-consumer sales channel. We find our customers, um, whether it's a, a, you know, a, a 
an angler who's fishing for walleye or, or smallmouth bass, we can use very different messaging for someone in, in one of those segments versus, uh, you know, many of you come from academia or, or utilities. Um, we use a, a different a sales ambassadors and, and even different lead, gen, lead generation uh, t- um, techniques um, so that we're really trying to meet our customers and address the problems that, that they face uniquely to their segment. And then uh, once we've sort of uh, helped them understand how the pure outboard technology can serve their specific boating application, uh, one of our sales ambassadors can hand them off to a field team member who can make the installation on a bare hull uh, in, as, in as little as 90 minutes. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. And thank you so much for, um, uh, for your attention. And I look forward to uh, answering some questions later on in the event. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alexander. It's it's great to learn about the growth of the industry and technology as part of this blue economy. And I have to say, I'm excited about the future, hopefully a very near future of pulling up to marinas with electric charging infrastructure for these boats and this technology. So now we're going to switch gears to electric ferries and I'll hand it off to Kevin for his presentation. Great, thank you. And, and thanks to Forth for putting this together. Uh, we love a chance to get out and and talk about our uh, efforts that are currently underway at Washington State Ferries. We're very excited about it. Um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll definitely uh, be a leader here in the United States and, and uh, globally as well. So um, let's see, my slides are not, let's see, my, let me see all the things. Here we go, perfect. So I'm Kevin Bartoy. I'm the Environmental Stewardship and Sustainability Program Manager at Washington State Ferries. And I'm going to try to condense our entire program into 12 minutes here. So it'll be kind of quick, but uh, hopefully we'll start with a little bit of background to get you all comfortable with who we are at Washington State Ferries. Not everyone does know us, but we are the largest ferry operator in the United States. And depending on what metric you use, we're usually in the top five uh, worldwide in terms of all those different things, size, people move, cars move, all those different types of uh, metrics that you can use to make yourself closer to number one. Um, we do have 21 uh, ferries currently, uh, We have 10 routes, 20 terminals. You can see this, we've almost, uh, nine, I have the 2019 numbers here because 2020 obviously does not reflect a normal year for us, but almost 24 million riders, uh, 10 and a half million vehicles. We do 450 sailings, that's per day on the water and 1800 employees. So it is a really massive operation and you can see spread uh, throughout the Puget Sound from Point Defiance and Tacoma where I am uh, in the South all the way up to Sydney, BC. I wanted to give a little bit of background in this to, to give the, the call to action, where we're coming from, why this, this really massive change uh, has come about for Washington State Ferries. And there's really three key things here, I think. One is that our agency as a whole, the ferries, uh, is a division of Washington State Department of Transportation, and we have a sustainability value that tells us to be resource stewards by supporting economic, environmental, and community needs. You can see that we envision sustainability as something that's a nested Venn diagram rather than the traditional tripartite uh, Venn diagram right there. We also have uh, the governor, uh, Governor Jay Inslee, who I've previously mentioned, my, my big boss, who has set us on a, a very strong course uh, for the green economy in Washington State. He did that with his executive order in 2018. It was uh, executive order 1801 that was updated in 2020. So executive order 2001 that uh, said that uh, we need to ensure that the Washington State ferry system begins the transition to a zero carbon emission ferry fleet, including the accelerated adoption of both ferry electrification and operational improvements to conserve energy and cut fuel use. So that was a really key document in moving our efforts forward. And uh, just last year, our state legislator, legislature upped the ante um, and they uh, increased the GHG reduction goals that you see in that uh, RCW, that law that I have on the slide right there. So that by uh, 2020, so by last year, we needed to be 15% below our 2005 emissions. By 2030, 45% below. By 2040, 70% below, and by 2050, 95% below, and net zero overall. So that's a very ambitious goal um, for uh, state agencies uh, to hit that net zero in 2050. The um, three things that have moved us forward, we've got this uh, direction uh, from on high. We also published in 2019 our long-range plan that gets us out to 2040. 
and incorporates these big picture ideas into things that become more implementable. From that 2040 long range plan, we've uh, had two other plans that came out of that to increase our, our implementation of the uh, long range planning goals. One was a system electrification plan that was uh, just published in December of 2020. And there'll be links to these things as well provided to you. So you can look in that. That shows us what I'm gonna talk about right now, our transition out to a hybrid electric feet, fleet out to 2040. We also have a sustainability action plan. Uh, we do it for our biennia. So our current one we're operating under is 2019 to 2021. We will be publishing our 2023 uh, coming up here in May, June-ish. Uh, it'll become active on July 1. So these documents are really guiding uh, us in as we're implementing these big picture vision items here. And this gives you a sense, I wanted to, as we start to drill down here, to talk about what this means, what we're talking about, what's the implementation, what is the transition that, that we're talking about. And you can see from this slide that we're talking about a current fleet of 21 diesel vessels. Those 21 diesel vessels today are going to be transformed uh, in, by 2038 into a fleet that looks very different, a fleet that has 22 hybrid electric vessels and only four diesel vessels remaining. And those four diesel vessels are our youngest vessels currently uh, in the fleet. That transition, we have it broken down into a near-term, medium-term, and long-term transition. It involves retrofitting some vessels, it involves building new vessels, and it involves retiring a lot of vessels at the end of their use life. So in the first five years here of our plan, we're retrofitting three of our vessels, our Jumbo Mark II class, I'll talk about a little bit, and we're building two new hybrid electric vessels of our Olympic class at the same time retiring a couple vessels. From five to 10 years out, we're gonna be building three additional uh, hybrid electric uh, class vessels um, of a design we're currently using. We're gonna be designing another uh, class of vessels, uh, 124 car ferry that we'll be build three of as well and then retire uh, five vessels at that time. Our last, looking really far out to the 10 to 20 year horizon, we'll be retrofitting three vessels, actually our smallest vessels in the fleet. So we start with uh, retrofitting our largest vessels. As we look out to the future, we're going to be retrofitting our smallest vessels uh, in the fleet. And then we will be building another one of those new class of vessels. And yet again, building another new class of hybrid electric vessels, which will be uh, seven new vessels and uh, those vessels will then replace uh, six vessels that will be in retirement at that time. This looks, um, that's on the vessel side. On the terminal side, we also have a lot of work to do. So you can see here, this shows us that we have 16 terminals that will be uh, fitted with electrical infrastructure to charge these vessels. We're gonna be working with five different utilities listed here across our entire system. So there's lots of challenges that are posed by that. Um, I'll keep moving here, talking about the investment. We're talking about almost a $4 billion investment uh, by 2020 that we'll be doing. I like this graphic because it shows you that by and large, the investment that we're making is largely for the vessel. So 3.7 billion of that is for the vessel and we have 280 for the infrastructure on the terminal side. So it is a very weighted distribution of where that money is spent. But I also like this graphic because when I say we're retiring those vessels, we're retiring those vessels at the end of their lives. So these vessels needed to be replaced anyway. So when you see that 3.7, it looks like a huge number. That was gonna occur anyways. We had to actually get new vessels on the water. The delta between building a traditional diesel vessel and building a hybrid electric vessel is very small in comparison. So this transition was a transition that was gonna happen. We're just doing it in a much greener way. I like to look at the return on investment, of course, that we have here. So you can see this bar chart is showing you how much we're investing over time, but it's also showing you that by 2030, our GHG emissions will be reduced by 53% below those 2005 levels. So we're exceeding what we're required to do um, by law. By 2040, we're gonna be 76% below, which again is exceeding by law. And we have a chance to exceed that 2050 number as well, or hit that 2050 number, I should say, since it's a net zero number with a little bit more planning. Okay. Move on here. And we're not just talking about GHG. So I'm glad to see uh, Alexander talking about those other air emissions that we're talking about here, which are very important, particularly with human health. 
So by 2030, with uh, the plan that we have in place, we'll be reducing SOX by 52%, NOx by 66 and diesel particulate matter by 53%. By 2040, those numbers will be going down to 75% reduction for SOX, 94% for NOx, and 90% of our particulate matter reduced uh, from our current state. Really quickly, uh, as I'm running out of time, uh, I'm going to give you a little brief overview of what's going on right now. So these are Jumbo Mark IIs. These are our largest vessels. If you've ridden our Seattle to Bainbridge route, perhaps Edmonds to Kingston, you've probably ridden one of these vessels. These are up for their propulsion renewal. Uh, they're going to go into dry dock anyway. We've timed it very well to be able to take the opportunity to hybridize these vessels. Right now they have four diesel locomotive engines that power these. We're taking two of those out, replacing those two with battery banks getting these vessels uh, on the water in a hybrid mode. These vessels, three of these vessels, there are out there that we will be hybridizing uh, out of the 21 vessel fleet. Those three vessels represent almost a quarter of our fuel we spend each year. So this is the biggest bang for the buck. It's gonna end up saving us fuel costs. It's gonna end up saving us costs. In the life cycle uh, cost models that we've run, it looks like that's gonna be a savings of up to $60 million. So this is a really good investment for the citizens of Washington state as well not just being an environmental investment, but also being an economic benefit. We're also building the new vessel I told you, the hybrid electric Olympic class. So this is a vessel that we had um, a design for off the shelf, which we've changed around a little bit to make it a hybrid electric. And that was launched in 2019. Uh, the build was launched. We're about 70%, I think, on the design right now. Uh, this should be going to construction this year and launching our first uh, brand new build hybrid electric vessels in the 23-24 range. Quickly giving you just a schematic of how this is going to work from the shore side. These are hybrid electric, so think about your plug-in Prius here. We do that to have safety on the water so that we always have, just in case we're not able to charge, we can have uh, the diesel engines as a backup to give us power to those batteries. So this shows you we go off the existing power grid, we go to our terminal, we try to build on existing infrastructure so that we're not increasing over water coverage that way. It makes it cheaper for us. It also is more environmentally beneficial. And then we'll connect up to the vessel that way. This is a schematic of how that looks right there. We have actually an arm reaching out to uh, the plug there on one of our wing walls. This is a design that turns kind of on the head what you see in Scandinavia, which they have an arm reaching out to the ship. This was an innovative out of the box thought that allows us to compensate for a lot of different title changes and uh, structure of our vessels. And I just really quickly on the ending here, uh, wrapping it up, just letting you know that this is a journey. We have this out to 2040. We're going to be planning it out to 2050. We're trying to hit all these big visionary goals, and we will hit them. It is a journey. I put this up here because this is our new Muckleteo. If you've been to Muckleteo, Washington, we just opened this terminal in December. This was a terminal that was 20 years in the making and that we put on the landscape with a lot of work from the community, a lot of work with uh, our tribes in the area to put a, a model building that has solar across it. It's actually producing energy right now. It's catching rain, using that rain. It's treating stormwater through uh, porous pavement. I mean, this is a this is a state of the art green facility. It took us time to do it, but we've really charted a course for the future at Washington State Ferries. This one on the shore side, uh, like I've been talking about, we're going to be doing that on the water really soon. And with that, um, I look forward to questions. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's really incredible to hear that you're coordinating with the government and communities. And I think you said five different utilities on the ferries and the terminals. That's definitely a feat. And it's also great to see the level of investment in Washington state in this electrification. So thank you very much. And we have quite a few great questions here. And again, if we don't get to your question in our conversation today, all the questions are gonna be shared with our presenters after the webinar and we'll make sure that we get responses to you if we didn't get to it. So I'm going to, while we're on the topic of ferries and all, again, uh, Kevin and Alexander represent, you know, these are very different yet related areas of electrified waterways. So I'll probably bounce back and forth between you and then we'll have a few that hopefully you can both comment on. So first, uh, Kevin, I wanna ask you, we have some questions around whether Washington State ferries looked at fuel cell technology as well. You know, this seems to be the route that many of the Nordic ferry systems are going. And so Christopher is curious about your thoughts on this technology. 
And related to that is also whether hydrogen and LNG were considered. Um, so if you could comment on that. Yeah, uh, I mean, we were we did have a LNG project uh, about a decade ago. We were actually looking to transition uh, over to LNG. Um, that project uh, was supposed to come out as a public-private partnership, and it never came to fruition. Uh, BC Ferries is doing a lot of work right now with LNG and um, and electric bank, so a hybrid system using LNG as a as a power source. Um, I think it was beneficial that our uh, LNG didn't necessarily work out because it put us in a position to allow some of these technologies on the battery side to develop. And Scandinavia is a perfect example. These boats are already out on the water. Um, I would say, so we're not a cutting edge anymore. This is not untested technology, but we are definitely on a leading edge. Um, with that said, the battery technology, I, I, you know, I'm not sure exactly on the fuel cell, and looking into that, the battery was something we, we definitely are, are looked into because we worked really closely with those operators in Scandinavia to see what was happening and what was emerging. So we really feel that this battery technology, at least for short sea shipping like we're in, is the future and um, just everything has come into alignment on that front for us. Thank you. And we're going to stay on the topic of battery technology and, and fuel options. And Alexander, we have a question from Bill. How do we scale up beyond batteries to onboard energy stored as hydrogen and or NH3 with conversion to electricity via fuel cells? So again, this fuel cell question and uh, and what's your vision for cruise ships while we're at it? Interesting. Uh, so, uh... I'll, I'll take it the questions in reverse order. With, with regard to cruise ships, we probably never go to such a large point. I think you can see from one of those early slides, we really try to focus where, where the, the most volume is in the marketplace. And so um, tr trying to decide on an outboard propulsion system was, was very attractive given that over 80% of, of boats sold and really across the world are powered by outboard motors. That lets us uh, focus our efforts on, on just uh, developing the powertrain. What I didn't mention before, what may not be obvious to a lot of folks, is that outboard motors, it, boating in general, it's, it's one of the, the only areas where there's this thriving market for powertrains, standalone powertrains, um, that can be sold separate from, from a, a vehicle or, or vessel. Um, and so that lets us really uh, spend our time laser focused on only developing the, uh, the core um, uh, uh, powertrain technology and letting other people think about the uh, the vessels themselves, um, and so that means that things like like ferries, cruise ships that are, that are massive applications, or or even vessels like larger um, sailboats or or stern drives, we just it's technology we probably never decide to to focus on in, in house at Pure Watercraft. With regard to um, to the question around fuel cell technology and hydrogen, um, we, you know the the name of Pure Watercraft is intentionally pure watercraft, not electric boat company or, or a hydrogen boat company or something. We wanted to be um, sort of a technology agnostic. Um, and so someday it, it may very well be that we've got alternative uh, fuel sources that we're using on board. But right now, the most efficient way that we can um, uh, push a boat uh, uh, in a way that, that sort of meets our mission of also being uh, conservation-minded and environmentally friendly and convenient for the end user um, the best way for us to do that right now is to use lithium ion uh, battery uh, technology and, and not um, fuel cells or hydrogen because you you lose so much efficiency as you're you're converting uh, along the way just with the, where the state of the art is on those technologies today and if i could if I could build on what Alexander just said on that, I think that, that it's a key point with and kind of going back to the question that I just had as well, that where we are in the Pacific Northwest makes a very huge difference for us uh, and our move to batteries. Because when we're looking at our sources of electricity, we do have, and I use green power in quotes here because it is hydroelectric, which does have its its own issues. But our, our source of power is hydroelectric, which is uh, cheap. And it is, you know, green in terms of those emission costs. So it made sense to have this battery technology tied into uh, the electric grid that we have in the Northwest. It kind of is the perfect coming together of uh, the electrical system that we have here and the uh, technologies that were emerging. So speaking of tying into the grid, we have some questions about charging. And Alexander, for you, a question around does the does Pure Watercraft and your charging systems, does it support fast charging, also known as level three, Chatamo charging? 
And for both of you, the question are, is around, are there charging solutions that can address both of the areas that you're working in? What does that charging infrastructure look like that might integrate these? Interesting. Yeah, so uh, I believe that we support up to level two charging, which is a, a charging that works off of a, a 220 volt um, uh, um, you know, outlet. Uh, and, then, and then if you don't have access to a 220 volt, it's, it's, this works uh, very, very well with a, a standard household outlet, a one, 110 volt outlet. I, th I saw a question in the chat along, line, along the lines of what if you moor your boat at a marina or on a private dock? And actually, most docks and marinas tend to have power just, just for a light, um, you know, for, for safety purposes. It shows where the end of the dock is. Um, and that, that uh, wire that, that feeds power out for that light bulb is actually enough to uh, recharge a, a, a system, no problem, uh, in, in for, you know, for most boaters. And I guess for us, I think we're talking about a whole different scale of power. Um, so we're we're bringing, you know, to our to our, we're getting dedicated feeds from our utilities. Uh, this is a massive amount of power we're talking bringing here. It's a very, you know, I would say it's pretty fast charging. We're, we're not, you know, we have a certain discharge rate uh, that we're building into um, the amount of battery banks and all those things. But we're doing all of our work in about a 20 minute window when that vessel comes to shore to offload and onload. So that's about a 15 minute uh, charging time with two and a half on either side to connect and disconnect. So I think it's pretty quick and that's gonna basically, we're sizing all the batteries to the routes um, so that we're gonna have a, a optimal discharge when we're hitting that uh, next terminal, plugging in, bringing us back up and then going ahead and, and discharging again when we're, when we're uh, across the water. And I, I mentioned before that we don't we don't have this big requirement that a lot of EV companies have if they're over the road to build out a nationwide or global charging network. Um, but some of one of the one of the nice things is there's some uh, customers that we will work with eventually who will benefit from installing a single fleet charger uh, at, a, at a, a location where there is actually frequent voting. So, for example, some of our utility customers or, or commercial customers, we serve a lot of uh, commercial rowing uh, programs. For example, uh, for their their coaching launches or um, utilities that operate uh, hydroelectric dams, where you don't want your patrol boats to actually be polluting the uh, the waters that you know are often used for drinking water and then are also generating your power. Um, just, you know, also you're in the power business, so it kind of seems like why would you be going and buying fuel when you actually produce electricity for your business? But um, so they might want to install just a fleet charger. Uh, which can serve, uh, you know, up to four boats uh, per charger. Um, rental rental programs will also benefit from things like that. Thank you both. And I want to switch to a question for for both of you about the regulations, you know, both for electric outboard motors that you have to comply with and consider, and also on the ferry side, uh, some questions around you know, as we call the red tape, so to speak, and what lessons you both have learned from that. I can take a, take a start. Um, from our side, it's interesting that the regulations are, are really actually not as stringent as you might think they would be. Uh, we, we face uh, some uh, some certifications from the, from the United Nations to ship our battery packs uh, via commercial carrier. So they have to go through some, you know, pretty rigorous testing there. Um, some of the, the most stringent tests we face are actually uh, mandated by the, the lithium ion battery cell suppliers that we work with. They want to make sure that the companies they're partnering with uh, are, are designing si uh, systems that are very safe uh, so that it basically minimizes risk, you know, uh, as one of their products um, culpable in something that's, uh, you know, in a, in a big bad news um, story, like uh, what happened with the, the Samsung uh, cell phones all those years ago with those uh, cell phone fires. Um, but uh, I mean, for, for us, we really have sort of more of an internal rule around around safety and our own standards are very high. The standards are really, are, are these uh, products safe enough that we would be okay with our kids out on board or our, our friends and family out on board using them? Um, that's that's really the, the test that we use because it's, it's actually on, on the recreational voting side, um, relatively lightly regulated. One other piece of that, I guess the flip side of that is to talk briefly about the incentives that exist. And I think it's, it's exciting to look at where some states are in terms of 
um, voting specific electric vehicle re regulations, electric vessel regulations. Washington state is really the leader in this actually. There's, a, there's presently a, uh, a sales tax abatement on uh, qualifying uh, electric marine propulsion systems and electric boats. Um, and that was passed by the legislature a couple of years ago. And we're really hopeful that many other states may look at what Washington has done and realize the, the benefits to incentivizing the adoption of electric uh, vegetable you know, propulsion technology. I guess uh, for us, in terms of the regulations, and this really is not my um, my area of expertise, but kind of the more big picture is that, you know, I think this is an important distinction I made earlier about cutting versus leading on edge. So when we have uh, Scandinavian other places who are developing this technology, they're working really closely with uh, other um, uh, nation states, as well as the classification societies uh, to come up with um, the uh, to basically help develop those regulations uh, aboard vessels. So now that we're bringing that technology really in this approach to these large vessels uh, in the United States, uh, there's, there are electric ferries out there of smaller size in the United States. But as you know, we're scaled up to, to our large vessels. Um, we're working really closely with the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, they're working with the classification societies. They're working with um, our designers as as they're developing um, their uh, rules and regulations regarding safety. Uh, initially, you know that that was also a big concern with LNG, uh, and and uh, we we saw that as I mean it's always a potential risk, um, but I think the Coast Guard's done a really great job in um, seeing the future of this technology and working with us and others to um, make make that regulatory environment not necessarily a hurdle to uh, keep people away from this important change. All right. And next we have a question uh, about for Kevin, if you'll be attempting to use the same sort of megawatt level charging standards that heavy duty vehicles will be using in the near future. I'm not familiar with those. I know that we are talking a lot of megawatts. I'm not an electrical engineer. So it's always funny when I hear um, when I'm in these conversations and, and they always get upset with me when I talk about our big extension cords and talk about it in those ways. I, I know that it's not that. Uh, I also know when we talk about megawatts, uh, you know, it seems, you know, when someone say, I forget, you know, says like 11 or 12, I'm always oh, 11 or 12. This doesn't sound like much. And then you, you say that to an electrical engineer and their eyes uh, pop out of their heads at the amount of power we're talking about. Um, so I, I don't know what's being used on the on the truck side. Uh, we're we really are um, having to build out our our charging systems. Our, our connectors are going to be unique to our system, but they're going to be across the system so that we can move our boats between routes. So there there'll be that interchangeability, but there is no off the shelf. This is one of the big challenges. There's really not an off the shelf technology that we could take and use for that charging um, charging infrastructure. Thank you. Alexander, there's a few questions for you about Pure Watercraft's boat systems, and I'm going to say a few of them. One is, is it possible to run two or three drives in parallel supported by multi multiple battery packs? And then the second one is if the motors and batteries are water cooled. Oh, excellent. So I guess I'll start in reverse order again. The, the cooling, um, we, we've designed the, the entire system um, to we tried to basically design all the maintenance, all the required maintenance out of the system. Uh, so typical outboard motors, gas outboard motors are, are water cooled. They use a, a seawater loop or a freshwater loop if you're on, on, on a, a lake. Um, and that's actually a, a source of uh, really frequent uh, maintenance, uh, uh, like support cases. You can get uh, sediment that gets caught up in there and then it doesn't, it's, your, your cooling loop is clogged or it's a, a, a space where invasive species will often get, get lodge in there and, and then uh, that's how you get a lot of these invasive species moving from from uh, body of water to body of water. So it's, we, we don't have one of those loops at all. We, our, our outboard motor is, is an entirely um, in cooled. It's a closed loop system. Uh, we have a heat exchanger down below in line with our, our electric motor and our propeller. Uh, and then we use a, a water glycol mixture that's uh, inside the outboard motor, which has a a small uh, seasonal, or excuse me, a small uh, expansion tank to handle the seasonal changes in pressure. So you never have to top off your fluids. On the battery pack side, uh, it's a um, it's a, a, a heat exchanger that's it's fully contained in the battery pack. Um, so we use a it's a liquid to air a, a heat exchanger. Uh, but the, the whole point of, of that was that we wanted to be able to 
um, be, be hull agnostic or, or vessel agnostic. So it's a drop-in replacement and we didn't want to have to retrofit the hulls in any way. Um, uh, and so that's why we, we chose to do it um, uh, in that manner. Uh, and then the other question was around, um, can you use multiple outboards? Yes, technically you can uh, outfit a, a vessel with multiple pure outboards. It's, you know, these are again, 50 horse equivalent systems and, and multiple modular battery, battery packs of ours that technically works. Um, if, it's, if it's my boat, I'm probably not doing that because the, the benefits that you get, the, the incremental uh, kind of top speed is really quite negligible, but you're doubling the cost. You know, you're paying for twice as much hardware. Um, so, you know, hey, if you want to do that, great, great for you. Um, and uh, I guess we'll support it, but uh, I'm, I'm probably not making that choice myself. You might want to wait until our next uh, product line, right? You, we'll, we'll, we'll just keep doing higher and higher horsepower as the battery technology continues. Sorry, looks like I lost my camera there for a second. I'm back. So we have a question from Richard. Hello again. And it's for both of you, apart from recreational boating and passenger ferries, do these ideas and technologies scale to barges, container ships, these mega, mega boats? Could you both comment on that? Maybe starting with Kevin? Yeah, I, you know, and, and I mentioned this, and it may be a term that's not familiar, but the short sea idea. That So short sea, you're talking about these ferries, you're talking about inland waterways, you're talking about that. This is definitely a space where um, battery technology, the, the charging that we're doing is, is going to grow. Um, this is happening with uh, tug and tow. This is this is gonna going to expand wherever you have a chance where you can home port, you know, easily for us, you know, it's, we're charging basically whenever we, we unload and offload. Um, so wherever you have that opportunity and, you know, for us in the Pacific Northwest with the source of power that we have, this is definitely going to grow. I think one of the big challenges though for the maritime industry in general is when you start talking about that long haul, when you start talking about that, um, the open seas, it, it's a huge challenge. It still is. I, I think not, not enough people, I, I only really got involved in the maritime maybe five, six, seven years ago with my work at ferries. Not a lot of people know how much we're on those large ships that are bringing our goods. You look around your house, you probably have most of your house has been brought over by ship. It's not coming by plane. It's not magically coming by any other means. It's coming by those big shipping containers we see. So this is a major um, opportunity and a major challenge. I think that the European community is going to start investing heavily in R&D on that front. I think there are many different um possible solutions, you know, hydrogen, I've heard ammonia. I mean, there's, there's just a plethora of things that are being looked at right now. Even wind um, generation is being looked at now. So there's lots of different things that are being looked at. It's, it is, I would say, probably the number one issue right now for, for the maritime is figuring out that, that long haul, that, that open sea. For the short sea, I think we have a solution. And I think what we need is the investment right now. And I think we can get that done. Thank you. Alexander, do you want to comment? Frankly, our technology is, is probably not as extensible to those larger applications like a, a barge. And so I think Ken speaks to it uh, eloquently. Um, where, where I think we see some of our technology, um, I guess one way to think about where we could bring this tech to bear uh, to, to sort of expand the scope of applications that we could power. Um, the best way to think about it is uh, our, we're, we're very good at powering uh, weight sensitive applications. So in, in uh, our, our outboard motor right now has uh, it, the, the motor itself uh, produces 25 kilowatt continuing power, which is about the same amount of power that a, a electric vehicle requires to maintain 60 mile per hour freeway speed, right? So um, and, and we do that in a much smaller package. So uh, where you need um, great power density or great energy density, um, and a little hint might be like there are some other applications on the water. Um, and for personal recreation or on the snow for personal recreation or uh, on trails and off road that uh, are that certainly fall into that bucket uh, of being uh, really kind of uh, have a high uh, power density requirement really benefit from technology that can do that. Um, those are the kinds of things that we might think about uh, and how we can kind of extend the benefits of electric propulsion 
uh, to you know help accelerate this kind of clean mobility shift. That's great. Thank you both. So I think we have time for one more question. And I'm hoping that you can both help us wrap up the Q&A by answering, just maybe recapping some of the prime lessons learned. Both of you are located in the Pacific Northwest with bountiful hydropower and some of these other contexts that you mentioned that are really conducive to what you're both up to. Can you share some lessons learned for lessons learned for those here who maybe elsewhere in very different contexts for the work. Um, I'm thinking myself of having lived in New Orleans with a very strong waterway culture, both for both of your technologies, ferry and boat. So yeah, could you could you finish us with uh, finish this out with some lessons learned for people elsewhere? Um, well, I, you know, I, I, I've lived in Tennessee as well, and there was still a waterway culture there on, on the rivers, um, very similar to what you're talking about. I think that, um, you know, in, in looking um, at other areas which may not have a supply of the, the clean hydroelectric power, you know, that we have here, the, the inexpensive hydroelectric power, particularly when we lived in Tennessee, you know, that a lot of electricity is generated by coal. So you're taking your car off the road, but you're, you're essentially powering it by coal when, you know, when you're plugging it in. Um, so there was always that conundrum that was there. I think that um, it, it has to change. It is changing. You know, we're seeing these changes in Washington State definitely will be out of coal. I mean, our utilities are, are going to be out of coal, I believe, by 2030, um, I think is the marker on that. Um, it's, I would say that we have to think forward. We have to think beyond what we have now. We have to think to what is next and we have to plan that way. And you have to get that support and the high level support um, to be able to implement these big ideas and to make them into plans. We essentially went from nothing, no plan to transition in 2016, 2017, I'd say, you know, maybe 17, we started really starting talking about this to now, which I presented to you a plan that gets us to 2040 a very, very good road plan that will also get us to 2050 and be net zero. Great. And Alexander, any quick final thoughts you want to share with everyone here? Uh, for, maybe just, just high level thoughts on, on, on lessons learned. Um, what, what strikes me about, about Kevin's remarks too, and, and just thinking about kind of the, different, the differences between how we might power our grids, um, it, it, it ultimately boils down to the, the benefits of, of of focusing on efficiency, uh, of focusing on on kind of minimizing cost. I think it's it's it, you're hard pressed to find someone who would say, oh, you know, I don't want something that's more efficient or or something that's that's better value. Um, and so the ways, you know, by by we're all part of this movement now, where as we we're really we're really starting to get that you know that proverbial flywheel spinning, um, where hopefully each you know, new uh, advancement, whether that's at the, the ferry level or, or, you know, on something as small as a, a sub 18 foot fishing boat. Um, every one of those uh, kind of incremental uh, uh, purchases, you know, helps to get us to a future that's a little bit more efficient at, uh, at converting energy uh, into a type of propulsion uh, that's, you know, much, much better for, for our collective uh, communities. Um, so that's that's what's I think pretty motivating, and that's that's a lesson I would take. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to Cindy now. Yes, um, we want to tell uh, say thank you all so much for joining us today and learning with us as we go and set sail for the electrified waterway. Um, I really want to say a big thank you to our moderator, Kelly Stevens. Uh, thank you. Um, the newest member of the Fort team, actually. So introducing her, <laughs> the, uh, the newest member of the Fort team. And a big appreciation to our speakers today, Alexander and Kevin. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, we truly, truly appreciate that. Before we wrap up, we have one final poll uh, for you all. Um, how did you find this uh, webinar? Did you find it informative? I personally did. Um, as new technologies and within the electric clean transportation develop, it's always fun to get to the cutting edge and learning about them. So. Thank you all. And as you will see, I'm going to close the poll right now. 
as you see, we have the contact information for our speakers here. Um, we will be sending out the webinar presentation recording and some few a few additional resources um, shortly after the webinar today. And we definitely know that the all of the questions didn't get answered today. So we want to make sure we can continue that conversation um, via email if we can't do it live um, during the webinar. And we hope you can join us in two weeks for Bridging the Gap Rural Electric Transportation Programs. Um, we will be here with our program manager, Aaron Gallagher, who will be speaking on uh, the fourth e-tractor program. Can't wait to get on that e-tractor myself. Um, as well as Rob Perrier from the Emerald People's Utility District, as well as David Soren from Blink Charging. Um, they will be discussing strategies to electrify rural communities um, and rural um, agricultural equipment as well. So I am definitely looking forward to that. And I hope you can all join us on Tuesday, April 13th. Thank you all so much for joining us today and um, have a great rest of your Tuesday and a great rest of your week. Thank you all. Thank you.